Synchronize swatches. Uh, <laughs> but if we synchronize our swatches, does that ma- it'll also involve like matching bands and stuff? Or uh, well, that's that is synchronizing, right? <laughs> <laughs> Hello, nineteen eighties. Welcome back. I'm, I'm, I'm lost. You are listening to Dots, Lines, and Destinations, a travel podcast with host Stephen C. Graves, Fosma Moon, and Seth Miller. Hello, and welcome to episode 328 of Dots, Lines, and Destinations. I'm Stephen C. Graves, joined by Seth Miller and Fosma Moon. Gentlemen. Hello. How are you? Pretty good. How are you? Uh, you know, staving off a headache, but I'm, I'm good otherwise, so. I've heard whiskey does wonders. <laughs> I'm sticking with coffee for now. We'll, we'll see how the evening progresses. <laughs> um, since There's no rule about not putting whiskey in coffee, is there? <laughs> I, I don't think there is, no. Um. The whole, like, genre of cocktails. <laughs> that, isn't that encouraged? In Ireland, I think. And a shot of whiskey. Yeah. Uh, since it's episode 328, I figure, and, and because our friend of the show, Hendrik, requested it, we should talk about United 328. I just hope that we don't have a running sequence of aircraft incidents numbered to match our <laughs> progressing, you know, in, uh, episode count. <laughs> Might force them uh, to slow down our recordings to reduce the aircraft crashes. <laughs> <laughs> <You know, our laughs> aircraft incidents. incidents. Yeah, we can't have those, so please don't record another show. <laughs> or just don't have the flight number line up. <laughs> um, Anyways. So well, I mean, three- the, the, the good side is after 9999, work on the clear. <laughs> you know, you say that, but completely derailing the conversation, what are we, less than a minute in? Uh, I was having a conversation actually with uh, Henry Hardebelt from Atmosphere Research, uh, industry sort of insider, and he mentioned that the uh, GDS platforms are actually working on adding another digit to flight numbers because of code shares and things like, uh, the. we talked about the United and the Archer UAVs and whatever last mm-hmm. week, or the drone things, the uh, electric vehicles, whatever you want to call them. Um, EV tall. That's the word I was looking for. Um, the, so we were talking about those, and it's like, yeah, no, they're all gonna have all those flights are gonna have United flight numbers on them. And in my brain, I'm like, that doesn't work. Mm-hmm. It, like, it would be impossible. There's just too many flights. And his, his comment was, he's got some in, some insight that says they're actually trying to get to a, add an extra digit to flight numbers. Wow. So let me, you know, really go crazy here. Why not just let you use characters in the flight number? Um, ATC does. Yeah. So why couldn't? Why would that not be the easier route? My go, move. go alphanumeric, you mean? Like on the whole. On the whole. Do you think that the PSS the, or the GDS platforms use numerics, or is it just a four character field? I would argue it's probably easier to change it to be an alphanumeric field versus adding a digit. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, flight T723? Yeah. I think it's more confusing for passengers than anybody else. Yeah. I think it'll be more memorable than a five digit number, though. <laughs> I'm on flight 10,327. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you think like three two six two seven would have a problem? <laughs> six five five three five. Yeah. You gotta you gotta you gotta you gotta, you gotta tell you gotta tell our listeners why why that's funny. <laughs> Let them figure it out. That's, that's the uh, you strike. It's, yeah, it's in binary. That would be what eight bits. Yes, no, sixty bits. Thirty two would be eight bit. Right. Two fifty five is eight bits, and sixty five k is oh, yeah. sixteen bits. So whatever. Three two six two. Oh, it's just three two six two seven is a signed integer. Mm. Versus 65, 5 through 5 is an unsigned integer. Bigger than that, depending on the data fields you're using, would crash the system. Just just what we need. Just what we need in aviation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if, if, if people remember back in the day when all of a sudden Twitter had to redo all their – or had to like re-architect their architecture uh, for tweets because they hit big int, which was I think 2 billion. Um, anyways. <laughs> all right. Back back to the topic <laughs> on hand. United 328. So this uh, – it had an everything, engine, went, everything worked exactly as planned, right? Yeah. I mean the engine failed over Denver. Um, and it blade it's cracked, blade cracked, and sent a cowling and a bunch of other parts uh, down to the ground. Uh, but the plane landed safely, and everyone was fine. Uh, but there, you said Seth that uh, the NTSB has investigated this and has some initial findings that are out now. Yeah, there, there was. There's been a sort of steady trickle release of information, and some of it, the, the initial pictures showing like the gash in the underbelly of the airplane, mm-hmm. were pretty dramatic. As well as it looks like. One blade sort of sheared off at the base, and there's been a, a sort of known issue with these blades. They're partly hollow on the inside to mm-hmm. I guess, reduce weight and provide heat transfer and things like that. And they were known to have some fracture problems, so airlines were required to inspect them more frequently. Uh, this one was not up for inspection. It, had, I think, had only like fewer than 3,000 cycles, and the rule was inspect every 6,000 cycles or flights. And this one you know, also cracked. And so now there's concern, do we need to change the inspection cycles or things like that? The NTSB ordered all of the blades industry-wide to be inspected before they can return to service. And unlike the normal inspection, this one has a, this is a more in-depth inspection and actually requires sending them back to Pratt & Whitney. 
Mm-hmm. So they're having to, instead of shipping the engines, they're taking the blades out, shipping the blades, and then they'll ship them back, I guess, if they're okay. But the gash in the belly was interesting, among other things, because if it had been a 777 200 ER, there would have mm-hmm. been a fuel tank there. Yep. Uh, but because it was one of the original, older, not not extended range models, it did not have the center belly fuel tank. So that's one sort of interesting bit about it. Uh, the other thing that I saw, I want to say Friday, uh, Thursday or Friday, there was uh, some additional information that came out about... Um, Ah, I lost the picture. Um, I had it up here for a second. Uh, just about sort of what they thought might have happened and what the process was and showing like where the crack was and significant where on mm-hmm. the side. So that's disconcerting in some ways. Um, they also said that the uh, fire extinguishers automatically deployed like they were supposed to, uh, but did not put the fire out completely, which is right. Cause the, there's that picture of it flying. Mm-hmm. The fuel had been, it was fuel start. They turned off the fuel supply to it, but it was still, it was, burning up, it was burning up stuff on the inside of the unit. Yeah. So um, there was also a lot of debate as to whether it was a contained or uncontained failure because of the damage pattern. Uh, the NTSB says officially, by definition, it was a contained failure because the none of the fan blades penetrated through the sides of the engine as they exited. But it penetrated the plane. <laughs> well, we don't know. We don't know if that was a fan blade component or a piece of the cowling or something else. Oh, right? Okay. Yeah. Or, I don't know. I don't know if the NTSB does. Yeah. Yeah. But yes, so yes, there was still damage to the body of the plane. It, that's it's a weird one that people are like okay, but like, are we like counting our? Are we claiming it's uncontained just for the sake of being able to say that? Given that like indeed the fuselage was shredded, uh, I don't know. There's some interesting stuff there. Uh, the real question is how many? Right, there were only 120 or 130 Pratt and Whitney triple seven two hundreds ever built, and only about 60 of them are in service right now, as opposed to being parked and like. The Asian carriers, had, which use them mostly for domestic service, had said that they were going to mostly retire them this year and next year anyway. So, like, why would they bother trying to bring them back, given that there's no demand? Yeah. Um, so that's, go ahead. That's really just United that might have a challenge if they need the planes. Yeah. I mean, there's – and uh, Korean, I think, also has a few, but again, planning to retire them. So, it'll be interesting to see what happens with them. But, I, you know, obviously, depending on how these extra inspections go with Pratt and what the new rules are, but I would expect – United wants to keep them around. So they haven't seen this issue with GE engines at all? No. no. Just the Pratt and And wasn't this like – this happened on another United 777. So, yeah. so there's uh, there's been a few of these incidents in recent years. Uh, in 2018, I want to say, there was a, fl- a United flight, San Francisco to Honolulu, that sort of on final in the Honolulu had a very similar incident. Um, landed – again, landed no problem, whatever. When this flight uh, happened in Denver, the rescue plane they sent to take the passengers to Hawaii was the frame that had that incident. <laughs> Um, and then separate from those two, it was Jaller ANA, I think, had uh, an issue early last year, early 2020. So there have been a few incidents in recent years, um, and that was part of the reason that people are responding a little more quickly. Yeah, yeah. Crazy. Yeah. I'm just, I mean, it's good that it ended in a, in a positive note. Uh, it's one of those things that like, you see pictures and people are freaking out. And I mean, I, I think we as kind of aviation geeks are like, oh, well, it's working the way it should, you know? Like, it and doesn't then, make. It, I will say it right. Like it's easy for me to be sitting here in my house in the attic recording a podcast, saying, "Oh, everything worked perfectly." Yeah, I have to yeah. imagine if I was on board, I would not be quite so calm. Yeah, I mean, I just remember us on the island when they were like, "We're gonna have to do an emergency landing." We're all like, "Okay, like, we have to do the brace position. We really have to do." Like it was a little more in the moment. You're like, "Oh, this is happening." Yeah, <laughs> well, and I guess that's also the thing. Like that, and that one we had what 15 or 20 minutes to figure it out. Yeah. Right, like they had enough time to do a new safety briefing and come to the exit row and like brief all of us on what to do and where to go. So. Right, we did have enough time to figure it out, but that was also when they were like, it's just a little thing with the flaps or the slats, whatever, like, it's fine. This would be like, oh no, the, the wing is on fire. Like, <laughs> they, you can tell me it's fine as much as you want, but I can see fire out the window. I don't think I'm going to be as calm. <laughs> I just, I think that's human nature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can see, you can see the, the impending issue. <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> no, that, that big thing out there, and it's huge, is not, in fact, doing what it's supposed to. Instead, it's on fire. Yeah, yeah, I just I'd like to think that I would have been okay, but who knows? <laughs> um, so U.S. airport transit funding rules are changing or have changed. Have changed. Uh, this is a really interesting one to me. Yeah, so go ahead and talk to it, Seth, because I didn't really. I kind of looked at this and I didn't. I didn't really understand it. Completely. So generally, if you want to invest any sort of PFCs, uh, the passenger facility charge, which is up to four dollars and fifty cents that you pay for each time you depart an airport on a U.S. from a U.S. airport on a ticket, uh, or some of the other monies that go into funding airports, there's there's a big sort of bright line rule. Everything has to be airport specific. All airport raised monies have to go back into the airports, and it's been that way, you know, quote unquote, forever. And the idea is basically to help prevent 
essentially what is the uh, Port Authority mess where like New York State is raiding the MTA funds because they want to, you know, the governor needed $160 million for something else and he just took it out of the subways. Mm-hmm. Um, so to avoid that, there, there's been sort of a hard line rule that says you cannot do anything with this money except airport related. And, you know, okay, taxiways or buildings and whatnot make sense. When you start talking about transit projects, though, it gets really challenging because it means that, like, when you build the air train to Newark, it can only, or to JFK, you can't go all the way into the city. It can only go from an end point, you know, from the airport to, like, one other place, and then it had to stop. If you go to additional off-airport places, people might ride it between those two locations, and then it's just local transit, and that's not allowed to be done with the money. (laughs) Uh, because it's not airport specific. It's not wholly airport specific. And the new rule basically is saying, actually, we're going to let you, as long as it basically is an airport function, we'll let you have multiple stops. Hmm. And so it's, it really shifts the way some of these monies can be spent. And I, that's how I understand it. I may have gotten it a little bit wrong, but that's how it was explained to me and how I've understood the changes. So um, it could be a huge deal, like, instead of having, you know, it's never going to actually work this way, but instead of the stupid backwards air train at LaGuardia, they could actually build useful connectivity. Uh, when they want to now rebuild the air train at Newark, uh, which is actually probably by the time this episode goes live, comments are closed, but uh, it's in the final throes of trying to get rebuilt and refunded and redesigned. They're talking about, like, why don't you just extend that to the path instead of extending the path all the way down to the airport? Right? Things like that could work, um, mm-hmm. but who the hell knows if it'll happen. So because the air train at LaGuardia, right, was going to go basically to where the it was de- flushing, yeah, to get the seven train. So you yeah, have to go to uh, Shea Stadium, right? Or- yeah. And and I always thought that was kind of weird. Like you're kind of going the opposite direction of the city. You're going away from the city towards a subway line that isn't as connected and towards a train line that isn't as connected. Um, it's still not a single seat. They, the frequencies are lower on those lines than on the other train lines that would be more useful it's a, it's a terrible plan but it basically allowed it's a lot of nimby in terms of avoiding uh residential areas mm-hmm. and then also i think there was some uh industrial land that got probably sold to the mta uh to make this work from people who definitely had a vested interest in pushing the program and the leadership yeah because like doesn't the n and the w go fairly close to yeah in astoria yeah, I was like, dip, dip Mars, right, or something. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, like, wouldn't it make sense to, like, build it along the Grand Central Parkway or somewhere like that and then, like, meet up with the N or the W and at least then you've got, you know, you're basically Central Park down Broadway <laughs> into town? Like, Have you seen how much of a mess the Grand Central is over there? Uh, well, And you can't go elevated <clears throat> because you run into the runway. Oh, yeah, true. Right, the 422, like, you land right over – four. Yeah. You're, you're landing right over uh, the Grand Central. So if you put, you know, a 60-foot tall – elevated rail and train system there that's gonna be bad also get in the way of the uh avion or a- aviation school that's right there that i think actually like watches the planes land as they do the training <laughs> but that's less of an issue than if in fact the planes would start hitting trains and that would be bad <laughs> that would be, that'd be a small problem uh, <laughs> so yeah i mean this is interesting because it seems like they could make some better decisions when it comes to building transit at airports yeah and it's, it's, it's way beyond obviously just new york i mean someone was talking to me about wouldn't it be great in boston because they could extend instead of having to now like run a stupid shuttle bus and this and that they could actually just extend one of the subway lines to the airport mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, things like that. And so, you know, like all like all of these things, we have to be careful. It's not just a good excuse of like, oh, it's a new this, that, that will also go to the airport. But in fact, is mostly fun- funding elsewhere. But I think it's good news. Or yeah. Potentially. Yeah. Very good potential to be good news. You have until March 12th to comment on the Newark airport. Yes. Replacement. Uh, this episode will go. Oh, no. Okay. They have one day. This episode goes live on the 11th. Get out there. <laughs> Make comments. Yeah. It, well, hell, the Newark one, they're talking about completely changing the routing of it, and like it's going to be a half-mile walk, basically, from... What? Oh, yeah, it's terrible. I mean, it's already not great. Uh- <laughs> well, it's, now it's just like slow and vaguely incompetent, but the new version of it is, um, instead of sort of doing the... You know how like, it comes in and then does like a weird loop? Mm-hmm. Uh, instead of doing that, there's going to be, from the P4 station, you'll walk to Terminal C, and from... Uh, and it'll just go straight instead of curving in and like be on the other side of the parking lot and you'll have to walk to terminal two and then it'll sort of go to, there's not going to be a stop at terminal one because they're tearing that down as part of the terminal a build out and it's just going to go over towards terminal a um, i mean what this is like a new trend that i've noticed with like public transit like uh it's seattle right you got to walk all the way through the parking garage like it's it's a good quarter mile half mile to get all the way to the train to go into town and it seems like they're just making it as hard as possible to, to, to use the thing that's the easiest to get into the central city. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't hate the uh, – I don't hate the Seattle one. Like it, it is a bit of a hike. 
um, to get out to the station. Um, it's not great. I mean, Midway is similar. Yeah. Actually, O'Hare is too. It's just O'Hare is inside, whereas Midway is through a garage. Um, I don't know. I guess it, it becomes one of those things where I'm used to it. Yeah. It's going to be P4. Um, the, and then it's like going to completely turn right. It's not even going to go inside the Marriott. It's going to stay outside the Marriott and go like from there straight across to the rental car facility. <laughs> It's a terrible, terrible layout. Um, it, it It is very far from what the terminals are supposed to be. It'll be great for the new Terminal – I'm sorry, Terminal 1, not Terminal A. I got that mixed those up. But I, um, yeah. And, and, and so then, okay, I have a question for you. How is LAX actually going to work? So as it currently stands, you take a people mover out like past the rental car facilities and from there you'll connect to Silver Line maybe? Yeah, I think it's still the Silver Line or the Green Line. One of those. Right, Silver, Silver Line is also Dulles, so it's hard for me to keep them straight. And Boston actually uses a silver line, I think. So I've got to take a people mover. Will that people mover be above ground, underground? You know, it's probably above, above ground. ground. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're building it right now in the middle of the parking garages. So in the U, uh, and it's, it, it's weird. It does a little zigzag. It comes in. It looks like it's closer to T7, T6, and then zigs to the other side to T2, T3. So T1 and 4 and 5 will pr- probably have the longest walks because mm. it ends at T bit. So it's not just like American ends- get screwed? Yes. I'm here for that. No. <laughs> I don't care. So you're saying it basically is a one, it's like a two tracks and it's like they, they go back and forth along this, this track. Is that? How? Yeah. Cause they, they're building a whole consolidated rental car facility and everything. Mm. Right. So where Avis and everything is. So a lot of that is torn up right now. Gotcha. Uh, and so that train will come out of there, stop at the rental car facility and then presumably connect to the silver line just a little further down. I mean, so to set this, I mean, this is like to your point, like this is one of those things where, yeah, the people movers probably being paid for, right? Right. With these funds. But the, the train, the actual transit piece is separate. Holy right. Separate. So instead of, you know, would they have made the silver line turn and go in? I don't know. But instead of having the silver line turn and go into the airport, you got to get off transfer. It's, it's no longer single seat, which is mildly annoying. Yep. Uh, oh, all right. I think we beat this one to death. <laughs> um, ATR is single pilot testing with FedEx. This is kind of cool. So for some of their smaller planes, right there, their ATRs, and I think they have some even smaller. They have some two hundred eight and stuff. Um, they're testing single pilot operations for for those aircraft. Yeah, uh, John Ostar got that scoop with the air car. It's a pretty cool story. Uh, he basically, yeah, they they are trying to come up with the actually. I think the story came out on Friday, and then United three twenty eight happened Saturday, and everyone's like, "And this is why you want two pilots on board." Thank you. Um, <laughs> it's worth remembering that cargo operations already have less restrictive rules. Um, in terms of pilot rest requirements and some other things, but they still require two of them for, you know, the multi-engine planes. Um, but it, it'll be real interesting to see, uh, if that goes anywhere, right? There, there's a lot of interest in types of single pilot operations. I would have guessed it would be smaller things than even the ATRs to start. Um, just, and who the hell knows if it'll actually ever come to pass. There's been some talk about it in, uh, the UK as well, as they're trying to like reestablish their, uh, what's it called? They're sort of industry <laughs> post Brexit, all the industries, but aviation is one of them. And they're trying to get, because there's a lot of remote and small areas where, you know, you can't drive or can't drive easily in the aisles. They're trying to come up with a way to significantly reduce both cost and uh, emissions related to those flights. And so electric aircraft and single pilot operations is one of mm-hmm. their approaches. Yeah. Makes sense. Makes sense. Kind of cool. Yeah. Um, back to United. They are starting some bus service in Denver. <laughs> Take the bus to the plane. <laughs> uh, what's this about? Uh, ski areas. If you want to go skiing, you can buy a ticket. I think it's Fort Collins, which I've been somewhat reliably told is not actually a ski area. Uh, and there's one other stop, stop that they're doing to start. It's basically, I mean, right? They used to have bus to Beaumont. They had bus to Allentown. They're now doing it in Denver. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're using what's it called land landline something like that this the same folks that uh sun country uses out of minneapolis to run the buses there it's seems like a nice ride nice enough ride it's a secure transfer for outbound so like you land at denver and you're connecting onto fort collins you go to a gate your bag gets put on the bus and you pick it up when you get to fort collins going the other direction i would assume it's your you put your bag on the bus and then you pick it off and then check it like a normal bag when you get to the airport i think is that how allentown does it or is downtown inside do you know I know going back to Allentown, it's inside. I don't know. Yeah. That's the, that's the one I'm never sure of is like going the other direction. I don't think you ever actually go – you don't go inside security at Allentown to do it. I don't think you do. So the bags would also probably need to – yeah, wouldn't be – I, I just I, – I was thinking about it. So it's Fort Collins and where else? I don't remember the other airport. I'll find uh, out what we're talking Because Fort Collins is definitely not a ski area, right? It's, it's like Breckenridge, I thought. Yeah, that's right. 
Breckenridge makes sense. Okay, that's a scary, but Fort Collins is like just straight north of Denver. It's flat. I mean, <laughs> I don't know, maybe cross country skiing. Um, I actually have a coworker that lives there and he would drive from Fort Collins down to, uh, Denver airport and okay. do that. But now if he can earn some miles, maybe he'll take the bus. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's, uh, I get it. Um, Landline is the name of the bus company. Uh, I get it. It, I like the idea. It's better in my mind than trying to run little puddle jumper flights, um, mm-hmm. certainly from an efficiency and environmental perspective. Uh, it's probably even makes more sense than the EV tall stuff, right? At some point, they'll just have electric buses instead, which will be far more efficient um, from a total passengers carried per electricity used and whatnot. But um, I don't know. It, I, I think it's a smart idea in a lot of ways. It's also like a little silly to try to figure out how to sell it. Uh, I think for the, uh, Ned, uh, who broke the story initially, Russell from Skift, uh, he had an interesting observation. It's like, oh, it's actually like the prices are pretty affordable for inaugural day service. And it was, I think, from Dulles to Fort Collins was $170 one way as a walk-up ticket, <laughs> which seems incredibly cheap or, you know, three days out, something like that, um, which is very affordable. But then I went and looked and there was a $45 basic economy or an $89 one-way ticket just to Denver yeah. on that same day on the same flight. So you're, you're actually paying, in that case, it was like 80 bucks extra for the bus. It wasn't a particularly compelling deal. Um, so they're going to have, I mean, and again, it, it's to the Fort Collins market, not to Denver plus a bus. So yay, airline revenue management, figure out how the hell that works. But uh, it's interesting stuff. Definitely. Um, so Iceland Air had a flight to Antarctica. This was uh, awesome. Yeah, they landed on the ice runway. 767. Runway. Yeah. Uh, and they transited. How did they get down there? They went Cape Town? Is that the way they went? Yeah. Um, and they did this. They were delivering scientists from picking different up. places or picking up, sorry, uh, from different places and bringing them back to Reykjavik. Uh, and yeah, I think they went to Oslo or Finland, right? Is they, did they go to Finland first? They, either, well, they went to Scandinavia. They didn't go back to Reykjavik. Oh, okay. Um, just fascinating stuff. Just that it's possible to do this, right? Uh, yeah. Landing world. a plane on a ice runway is, and it's like, and it's right. It's not like a 727 or a 737 with 200 with gravel kit. It's like a normal 730, 767 that lands everywhere. Yeah. Um, I guess the gravel kit can land everywhere too, but uh, still, it's it's just really incredible. Also, like that they managed to truck in the infrastructure to build an airport. Yeah, out on the ice, yes. right. I mean, not only that, they have a firefighting brigade, right, um, yeah. in in Antarctica, just in case you know an engine catches fire or something. Uh, it's it's yeah, it's wild. Yeah, just don't dunk it in the ice, no. <laughs> uh, really cool though to see for sure. There's, I think there's some videos online of it taking off and landing potentially in Antarctica. Yeah, no, there's some great stuff from it's from the troll base. Uh, also, they use like little moon buggies to get around on the ice down there, and they are way cooler than Dulles moon buggies. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't take much. <laughs> I was gonna say I've never considered the Dulles ones uh, cool. I think it's cool that you can load an airplane from those things. Sure. <laughs> and that's cool. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, they uh, returned via Oslo. Again, Oslo. via Cape Town, back both ways, and then Oslo. Gotcha. Um, Boeing says the new Airbus plane could be dangerous. And this is after Yasa said it first. <laughs> Boeing justifiably caught a lot of flack for putting out a statement basically saying, oh, you guys should be really careful. That, t- that, that fuel tank layout looks dangerous. Um, and it vaguely is but people are making fun of boeing for saying that um and there's a whole lot of you don't compete on safety except airlines and manufacturers have made cl- very clear they do in fact compete on safety um even though it's bullshit uh <laughs> but yeah that was uh that came up it was basically the issue is that in order to get the xlr the lr and the xlr have an extra fuel tank in the center in the fuselage mm-hmm. um at the back of the plane and it you know it changes weight and balance a little bit but it also uh on the lr version it's effectively portable or removable. And that was one of the big selling points for the LR early on was like pay a couple extra bucks to have this fuel tank installed. If it turns out you don't need the range and you're not using it, it's real cheap to just remove it. You can fill that with bags and other stuff instead. That was one of Airbus's big selling points. The XLR, they're going to take that same tank, but instead of making it removable, mount it, you know, like weld it in kind of thing to the frame. And that increases its capacity or usable capacity without increasing the size of the tank somehow um which is pretty interesting but it also changes like how close it is to the fuselage skin or something like that and because it's for you know hard mounted there's a risk like related to punctures or other things where a hard landing could puncture that tank more readily or you know like a tail strike could puncture that tank more readily than uh than if it was the, just the lr version or if there was no tank at all and so it needs some additional consideration for how they're going to you know handle it from a firefighting perspective, from a fire prevention perspective, from all those things. And IASA, there's a great story from Flight Global about, how, hey, this is an issue. They're working on it. And then, like, that was quickly overwhelmed by Boeing sort of echoing that statement and being like, hey, guys, look at this problem. And <laughs> it's 
you know, fine if they want to do it, but also it comes across to me as a bit a, a dickish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A little, a little childish. Yeah. You know? Oh boy. <laughs> um, Lufthansa. Let's talk about Lufthansa because that some some news came out. Uh, they released a statement about what, what their future fleet is going to look like, and that does not include A three eighties. It does not. Nor does it include most of the A three forties. Yeah. So I think the the basis of their fleet is now going to be this or the seven four fours. The seven four fours are gone as well. Now um, was this only Lufty or the entire group? I thought it was the entire group. I think it's the entire group as well. There's two this- different sets of data came out. Um, there's the overall Lufthansa group fleet and then the Lufthansa specific fleet. Okay. Um, yeah, because one of the ones I saw I had the 772 on it. And I know that Lufty does not have them, just Austrian. Right. Um, which, who, by the way, retired its first 763 finally last week. Are th- are all of their 763s going? I believe so. Wow. So they'll only be left with 772s. Wow. That's crazy. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of fleet simplification going on around Lufthansa group. One uh, interesting point I saw raised uh, – was that, you know, a lot of people are talking about sort of upgaging operations to be able to carry the same number of passengers with fewer planes. Um, airlines are talking in that direction, right? Delta is saying that. United is sort of saying that. For Lufthansa to do that while also retiring the 744s and 380s was going to be really hard. Like, is the 777X or the 777-9, whatever you want to call it, A, they don't really know when it's going to show up, and B, is that enough mm. to sort of offset some of these other uh, shifts? Well, so they are taking 77Ws, right? And 787s. Do they have a 77W also? We no, they don't. Swiss That's Swiss. Swiss has a 77W. I'm just wondering if Lufthansa is going to take it. I thought they were only taking the Dash 9. Mm. The, and the W being a 300ER. Um, that would make sense. I, I mean, but the taking the 787 really doesn't increase. It's not a ton of capacity, right? I think it's like listed on there. Their thing is small, like has a small airframe. Yeah, the 787 <laughs> is Dash 9 would be more about, uh, I feel like replacing some of the 330s. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, they're saying it, it, it puts it, they put it in the sort of around the 340, 340 300 in that capacity. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the 350, 900. Yeah, I'm looking at this chart now. This has got to be, uh, group wide because it has the 772 and the 763 in it that Lufthansa itself doesn't fly, right? Um, so yeah, they're going down from one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven types to six. That's significant simplification. I really like that they have a special graphic for four engine airplanes. <laughs> I, you know, the one thing I, I will say is I don't mind, like, the simplification makes sense. The one thing I don't like is that, you know, their 359s have the new business class seat, the, the 748s have the new business class seat, and I'm not a fan of it at all. Uh, I think it's it's fine for, you know, sleeping in, but it's it's a weird seat to sit in. Can we call uh, it new anymore? Yeah, I mean, it's not even really that new. I hope that they do something about it. So there, there's actually, remember that three years ago when they were named a five-star airline by Skytrax, it was because they announced their brand new business class? <laughs> See? Coming soon on a 777-9. Exactly. Um, and now those are delayed till like t- three more years. I-, I believe the company has now said they, rather than waiting for those aircraft deliveries to to launch the seat, they will now see about retrofitting or otherwise making it show up sooner. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is a similar business class seat to what United and Delta have kind of done where it's like the staggered seat. It's staggered. There's, uh, it's not a suite. There's no door. Um, right. There's like a giant throne seat in the middle. Mm-hmm. Um, even in Even the center aisle on the... 777-9 was supposed to be a sort of alternating one, two stagger front to back rather than two, you know, two and two offset from each other. So there's that sort of throne seat with giant side tables and whatever. It was, it's an interesting design. Um, I don't think it's particularly special, but it's better than, I mean, better's relative. I, I don't know. I mean, it's, hard me to hate, it's hard for me to hate on business class seats in general. Just like I, yeah, I'm not, I get I'm not, in, I sleep, I, I, get, I get out where I'm going. So it's not a, it's not a Recaro. That's I mean, like, you know, economy seat. So yeah, <laughs> I think the thing, the thing I was most surprised with is they're keeping the, Seven four eight. Those are, if I remember correctly, very premium heavy, and so I mean, which uh, still surprising that they want to keep them. But given that you know, premium heavy means business traffic, and no one knows when that's really going to rebound. But I think my recollection is like when they would swap three eighties and seven four eights for each other, it was based on the more premium heavy routes would get the seven four eight, not the three eighty, because they could sell way more business class seats on it rather than just filling the backup in economy on the three eighty. Interesting. Yeah. So it was just surprising because yeah. they haven't been particularly thrilled with them. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, well, and, and two, like, right, they had made a move to Munich with some of the A380s and stuff right as COVID was hitting. Right, that was like a little yeah. Bit that's more. I think probably more just about fighting with Fra- Fraport than anything. But maybe they can move them to Berlin to block the sun in the afternoon. <laughs> What are you talking about? For those who about? don't know, <laughs> the laser, for those who don't know, the laser, uh, what are they, fire detectors? Fire, yeah, fire Smoke alarms. Are, are being set off by the sun. Uh, our friend Hendrick, let us know. <laughs> so now they've turned them off for an hour every day. 
<laughs> oh, man. That's what you want, right? You don't want to have fire protection for an hour a day. It's, it's no big deal. No, no. Especially uh, in the afternoon, right? There's not many people at the airport in the afternoon. No, no, no. Um, Air Sinai is going away, maybe. Uh, this was reported on Globes, uh, and it's basically Air Sinai was the carrier between uh, Tel Aviv and Cairo, kind of the tertiary carrier of Egypt. Yeah, we talked Air. about that a few, I say a few episodes back. It was probably more than a year ago now. <laughs> yeah, um, and so I think Egypt Air is just saying, "Hey, we we need those two twenties to actually fly routes for us, so we're just going to call it Egypt Air and just fly the route ourselves." And actually integrate it into their real operation. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's kind of the the, the takeaway from this. So. Anyway, um, on our bonus show for our Patreon subscribers, we're going to talk about a little bit about a, a hack of, of frequent flyer data and some airline, uh, Iranian uh, aircraft acquisition policies, and that's coming up right after this. Uh, if you want to hear that show, you can become a Patreon subscriber. Um, yeah. Can we do one quick follow up? I'm sorry, I had. Uh, oh no, I, I thought it, yeah, just from last week, the United Boston Heathrow service. Oh yeah, I dropped the ball. I did, you wrote it. I didn't read it. Yeah, <laughs> it's okay. I, there's two interesting bits that I've learned about this. One is there's. Uh, some of the just the cabin layout stuff, like on the JetBlue A321 LR, it's business class is going to go all the way back to the exit windows. It's going to be a pr- pretty interesting cabin layout um, when all is said and done. Uh, but the other part of it is they they announced where they got the slot. It is actually a, they acquired a new slot. United acquired a new slot for the service, and it came as a uh, remedy slot from I believe the uh, One World Joint Venture Group to allow that service to happen. And so those remedy slots at Heathrow were one of the ways uh, JetBlue was trying to gain access to Heathrow Airport. And there's some interesting just sort of having them, having United get that slot from, you know, American and British Airways rather than giving it to JetBlue is super interesting to me. Yeah. Like, I almost wonder if, you know, wink, wink, nod, nod, someone in American didn't call and be like, hey, can you guys just like run one of your old paid off planes on this route? We'll give you the slot. We just, we want to try to keep JetBlue down. And, you know, officially, of course, that would never happen, but I really wonder if. Well, I wonder if there's a, there's a bigger part of that, right? JetBlue doesn't have an operation there. So, where the, you know, there's a lot of different pieces is in order to get the slot, do you, can you get the ground resources to be able to, before they give you the slot? You no, know, they, they would, I mean, they're going to hire out, uh, Gate Group or whoever to run Swissport to run ground services, whatever, no matter what. Can, and they have to they get, have a general manager for the UK that's actually right, but, been there, but. But the, can they get access to a terminal, a gate, all those different things, right? Sure. I mean, Yes, they would be able to do so. Right, Heathrow would make sure that, well, especially now when there's such limited, uh, such low usage. But uh, even when it comes back, they would. Part of this lot stuff is, and I know it's not always that way at every airport, but um, I think because the way the new entrance slots work is the people giving them up have to basically facilitate to make sure that those other services are made available okay. because it's a remedy slot. I'd like to see a JetBlue plane at T five. <laughs> You did a little 321 tucked in among the 380s. <laughs> the C pier? Yeah. Well, I was say, it, it, that, it only would be itty bitty at the C pier. At the A pier, it would actually look pretty big compared to like the 319s. So, 320s. Hmm. But anyway. Oh, sorry, I, sorry, I missed that. Fall. No, that's no, okay. I just the slot thing I think is super interesting and sort of JetBlue keeps trying to get that Heathrow slot and it happened and it's looking more and more like that is going to be the operation of choice. Yeah. Not Stansted? <laughs> the, from what I understand, because of the way the slots were given back from other airlines and such, uh, Gatwick is probably where the flights are going to end up. They could, try the, they could try the Continental strategy, fly to every London airport other than Heathrow. Yeah. At that point, it was because they couldn't, legally. Uh, well, I think that's the show. Again, some bonus topics coming up for our Patreon subscribers. If you'd like to follow us on Twitter, at dotslines, more dotsmorelines.com. Leave a comment. Tweet us. We'd like to hear questions or comments or uh, feedback. So uh, thanks for listening and uh, happy travels. Bye-bye. Take care.